Given the issues highlighted throughout the day um, at this conference, health, violence, uh, wellness, education, advocacy, what are some issues that you experienced as an Asian or Pacific Islander woman leader and ways that you have been able to challenge, resist, and transform these issues? Who wants to go first? I'll start, okay, I guess I'll start. It's been an amazing day and so many stories. And thank you to Connie and Jenny and everyone that made this happen. Thank you all for being here. I, I think I attached to everything because health, violence, education, advocacy. Um, as a second generation Filipino American, right? Philippines, a colony of, the, of Spain and then the United States, um, health. Health was an issue. Um, I think uh, growing up, especially with a Catholic Filipino parent who didn't want to talk about relationships and sex and um, you know puberty, I, I ended up being a teen mom. And that navigating that system in itself was was interesting. Uh, finding my own healthcare route, finding um, healthcare for my son. Um, and then trying to, you know, um, have a system that supported, supported me. Violence, um, my, my parents divorced when I was 12, and we ended up moving from Guam to California, my mother and my stepdad. And when I had to marry my boyfriend, um, he was really resentful. And um, it... it uh, it turned out into a, a verbally, emotionally, and physically abusive relationship. And it took me a long time to get out of that. Um, I guess more than three years. And it really wasn't until I saw my son and realized that I needed to not continue the cycle. Um, because my uh, father-in-law was very much like my husband at the time. And I didn't want my son to continue into those footsteps. So I, I finally left after numerous breakups, um, arrests and, and prison stays on, or jail stays on his part, hospital visits, um, and attempted suicide on my part, I finally left. Education, though, was my safe haven, right? You think about what we're doing in schools and how schools perpetuate uh, colonialism. Well. For some reason, school was, was my safe haven. And honestly, if it wasn't for my high school teachers who advocated for me, even though my, call, uh, my high school counselor was trying to get me transferred, uh, I knew I was going to college because I knew I was going to uh, be a learner forever um, as I currently work in, in the education system, the K-12 system. But they advocated for me, and if it wasn't for them, then I wouldn't be in education because I felt then, and I, and I do feel now that I need to pay them back for the support that they gave me. And it's one of the reasons why I do what I do um, with my work in K-12 and trying to change the system for a lot of our folks, a lot of our kids that continue to be marginalized. So are, are we going? I guess. Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, so yes, I'm Maria Carmen Hinayon. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I am a transgender woman. I am a woman of transgender experience. Um, and I'm an immigrant because I was, I, I was born and raised in the Philippines and I came in this country um, before I turned 21. And I've been here since 2004. We've got like 12, 14 years now. Um, let me begin by saying transgender women are women. This is a very simple statement. 
not a lot of people seem to get it. Um, we're all women. It's just different experiences and different journey. Um, but we share the same struggle. We have a common enemy. I'm not going to name it or who. Um, <laughs> Cheetos. Well, it's patriarchy, but sometimes it takes a human form and gets elected. Um, uh, and also, transgender rights are human rights, right? Simple statement, very true. Um, because at the root of it all, we are all human beings, and we deserve to be respected and to be treated with equal dignity. Um, to the question, there's a lot to unpack. Healthcare, education, violence, it's like the summary of my life. Um, <laughs> so I grew up in the Philippines, just as um, she mentioned, it's a very conservative country. It's predominantly Catholic. Um, my family in particular, because I, I grew up in the provinces, um, very conservative, very Catholic in a small town that is very tight knit. So everyone seems to be minding each other's business including my gender. Um, so it was tough. Violence is a constant fixture in my life. As a child growing up, I have experienced violence in the form of gender correction. You know, those types of violence that we see. And it's common stories. We see it. We see it in movies. We see it in a lot of things where, like, you know, we're going to make a man out of you, so we're going to subject you to physical abuse. I have experienced sexual assault as a young, during the early days of my transition, um, by not one, one, but a lot of men, and then another one with one man. And when I tried to seek justice, I was told that I should be thankful because um, they are making me a woman, which is what I wanted. And this conti kind of continued in my life, even when I went to the United States. I've had two domestic violence relationships, um, both, it, you know, both partners in both incidents, I almost died. Um, and I've had, had um, assaults. And they're all connected to my identity as a transgender woman and the stereotypes attached to my heritage as an Asian and Pacific Islander. You know, the usual thing about being submissive, being subsumed, quiet, feminine. So when, you, when you're a smart woman like me who likes to talk, you get hit, right? Um, so that's that. I mean, we could write a book. I'm not going to. Let's do it. <laughs> um, but it's also a lot of ways connected to my transgender identity, right? So in many ways, violence is used to invalidate my existence as a person and to remind me that I will not be respected and cherished as a woman, right? In a society where women is stereotyped, again, as someone who needs to be protected, like a China a, a vulnerable, precious China. Um, so it, there's a lot of layers and dimensions of violence in my life. Um, but, you know, since I graduated law school and I worked and I started my practice and I have um, made a lot of changes in my life, you know, you learn as you go. You figure out ways as part of your survival. You know, I've, I've been violent free for many years now, so I'm happy. Um, regarding healthcare, again, it's very much tied up with my transgender identity. Um, for transgender people, healthcare is not a matter of a question of privilege or right, it's a question of life or death. If we don't receive um, life saving transgender related treatments, such as hormone therapy, um, a lot of us. Um, because the, dis the transgender medical condition is connected to um, the mind, uh, we have the highest rate of uh, suicide. And a lot of us engage in survival type of activities in order to access health care, right? So going to the streets, survival sex work. Um, prior to Obamacare, I remember when I was living in San Francisco, we had to 
to get our hormones from Mexico um, through smugglers um, because no way we are going to get it here in the U.S. Thanks to Obamacare, um, health care and medicine was, for, was made accessible to people like me, um, which is why it's very important for us to do the political work to, to keep our health care. When I was in the Philippines, there is zero health care for trans people. There is zero recognition legally for trans people. So we have to work with women. Cisgender women is very, you know, I owe a lot to them because they are crucial to my survival. They have been my strongest ally. At the time when I needed hormones for my transition, the way to get it is through birth control pill because birth control pills contain estrogen and other, you know, those feminizing hormones. So I would be friends with women who would be willing to share with me some of their excess birth control pills that they would get from the health clinics and the drugstore. Um, so it's been very exciting. In terms of education, just like you, education was my saving grace through all the turmoils in my life. Education is that one shining star. I grew up from a family of educators. My grandma was the, the, the school superintendent. My aunt was the principal. My aunties and uncles were teachers. So education was inculcated in our mind that no matter what happened, that is one thing that you could always rely on. So I latched on to that no matter how difficult and painful life is. You know, and I've always excelled there. I was valedictorian when I, you know, ever since I was kindergarten, I was either salutatorian or valedictorian. I went to the number one university in the Philippines, University of the Philippines. I, I came to US and I wasn't able to go to school immediately because I had to survive. But at the, ta the first time I left my abusive relationship, the first place I went to was, a, a university to inquire how I can get admitted. Because I know if I get to step into the school, I might be safe and my life might go back in track. It's like, it's like when Voldemort returned, we gotta, get to, <laughs> we gotta get to Hogwarts. That's the only place we could like be safe. I mean, it's kind of like what we have now, you know, we gotta stay in California because California is like Hogwarts. The federal government is like the Ministry of Magic. <laughs> and, and Voldemort is there. Anyways. <laughs> so education was my seven grace. And you know, it's not that I didn't experience bullying. I did. But because I'm just really smart, I, I was able to like brush it off. Because I'm like, well, my grades are higher than yours. So what? <laughs> And I got scholarships, so what? <laughs> so, so yeah. So just like you, um, education is 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 what brought me um, to a place of safety and a place of comfort, and an gave me the opportunity um, to change the course of my life, regardless of the cards I was dealt with when I was born. Um, oh, thank, thank you for that. As an educator, like I love hearing that. So all the students in here. Graduate, please. I'm looking at all you East Bay students. Where are you? Hey. <laughs> Lynn. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lynn Lee. I'm the founder and CEO of Society9. Uh, we're a women's boxing brand. Uh, we're the brand for the fight in every woman. And we make boxing gear and active wear to empower you in your fight. Um, I, I'm here to be a listener. I'm here to be a receiver. Um, I've been here since this morning, so I've listened to so many of the panelists, the stories um, from audience members, attendees. Um, and it was funny because I was actually saying to, to B, I was like, I don't feel like I deserve to be on this panel. Um, and she was like, why? And I said, that space needs to be reserved for you know survivors. I've been fortunate, I'm privileged. I I'm not a victim, nor am I a survivor. And she brought up a really important point, um, and I'll share a little bit of my recent protest um, from a, just a few weeks ago. Um, it'll give a little bit more context. But um, 
she said to me that you may not be a survivor, but it is so important that survivors like us know that you are out there willing to hear us and willing to speak on our behalf. Um, so if I may ask the audience, how many of you in the audience are not survivors? Okay. I encourage all of you to reflect, and because I've had to do this in my role, because with my business, we make boxing gloves. I didn't set out to just start a boxing glove company and that's all that we do, but we're a community of women who are strong and empowered, women on all parts of the gender spectrum. I have gender non-binary customers, I have transgender women customers. It doesn't matter. If you celebrate the, the powerful feminine warrior spirit, we're here for you. Um, which, what that's done is that it's welcomed a lot of um, survivors who feel compelled to share their stories with my team. I get emotional thinking about it because, you know, it's like, yes, we, we sell product, but then we get these stories that come into our like customer service email saying, you know, I just started boxing a few months ago because it was the only way that I felt like I could regain my power after I was assaulted. I can't tell you how many variations of that story we get. And so in some ways, I, I, sorry, I'm like, whew, gotta take a deep breath. In some ways, I feel like it's, it's mine as like the founder of Sinai, but also my team. It's our job to be um, both the protectors and the gatekeepers of these stories, but also to use our privileged platform to speak out on their behalf. And so, um, you know, it was mentioned earlier that I was on the Forbes Their Own 30 list. That was a huge honor. The summit, the annual summit was a few weeks ago in Boston and Senator Jeff Flake was a keynote speaker and this was literally in the midst of the vote. Um, and he was the one toss up. I mean, we knew he was gonna honestly probably vote yes, which was frustrating, but for some of us attendees who were affected either personally or by way of, in my case, being the holders of these stories and these experiences, is like, why are we gonna sit here and use our privilege for nothing. You know, we can sit here and golf clap, oh, like, great speech guy, or we can actually let him know that, like, we're paying attention and we're gonna hold you accountable. And so we, um, a group of us, uh, attendees and honorees, we decided to organize a silent protest um, knowing that he was gonna be there uh, because we didn't wanna risk getting thrown out. It was really important for us to ensure that we held our ground, but also that our presence was heard, seen, and known by him. And so we, within like 24, 40 hours, we put up flyers at the Women at Forbes event that was the day before, plastered it all over the bathrooms. The Forbes media people, they were going to intervene on the protest. I actually overheard the <laughs> organizers. I felt like I was in the CIA. I was like, <laughs> I was, because I was, I was going into the bathrooms in between all the, all the speakers to put up the flyers so in the, all the stalls so they wouldn't know who I was <laughs> or who was putting them up. And so on Monday, all of a sudden, I, the flyer basically called for attendees and honorees to uh, dress in black in solidarity with victims of sexual assault and violence um, and to show up at the, the day of the keynote. And we, I actually worked with Amanda Nguyen's team, who she's gonna speak later this afternoon, worked with her team, got the names and testimonials of survivors from Arizona, where Senator Flake's constituency is, and we held up their name saying, you know, I am Cecilia, I am Tennille, all these, all these survivors who came from Arizona, we held up their names in silence for the full 30 minutes that he was speaking, and we all ended up on the cover of the Boston Globe the next day. <laughs> Uh, which was, uh, we didn't expect that to happen, but you know, for those of us who were able to use that, our position of privilege, I mean, that's what, that's what we really hold the power to do. And the other thing that we did was, the Forbes Summit was unbelievably white and male. And what that did to the editor in chief of Forbes Media, because he was actually walking around the summit and, and introducing himself to people, we said to him as a constituency, if you will, us honorees who are frustrated with that lack of representation, we said to him, you need to have a diversity uh, and inclusive um, uh, like advisory board to, to advise you on changing up your representation for these summits because you're focused on the under 30 
demographic, right? The future business leaders of America, whatever. But yet you are not focused on the actual spectrum of what America looks like. And so, you know, between the protest and between using our platforms of privilege to make sure that pe people in positions of power are hear us or hear those who can't speak, um, that's what I'm here for. So for me, it's a privilege to be here with you. It's a privilege to sit up here to hear your stories. Um, and I really hope that I can only build more relationships from here to make sure that all of your voices are heard um, as a first generation Vietnamese American, um, daughter of Vietnam War immigrants who have inherited in some ways their traumas and their stories and how I I'm shaping my own identity, um, you know, I still see myself in a position of privilege. So in whatever way, shape, or form that I or my company, my platform can can help support and strengthen you, that's that's my life's mission. So thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone. Thank you everyone for staying uh, through to, to to this point. Um, I really want to Thank Connie and Jenny and everyone who is involved in this amazing um, adventure. And I know it's going to continue. Uh, they've got big plans. And so you should be very proud that you're a, a part of the inaugural of hashtag I'm ready movement. Um, so, yeah, give yourself a hand. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm from the Midwest, uh, the daughter of immigrants. And uh, in the Midwest, there were no Asi other a Asians. And so it was not easy growing up in an all-white community where I think there were four other uh, Asian families. But we all owned restaurants, so we were competitors. So we really didn't, you know, bind because our, our fried rice was better than theirs. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I would go to school, um, it was a difficult time because I was bullied because I was the littlest person and bullies like to get the reaction of making you cry. And that was easy because they would say things like, Ching Chong Chinaman, you Chinese eat rats. And I didn't, I couldn't process that. And so I would run home, I'd cry and I'd run home. And my mother would say to me, you know, and at, at age seven, you represent the Chinese people. It's a big burden, you know, for a little seven year old. And so, you know, I always did well in school because that was the only thing that I could do because that was silent. I could, you know, do well on the tests and, uh, you know, do great reports and, and the teachers, you know, I was very docile. But I couldn't be like everyone else because there was nobody else like me. And so it wasn't until I went to the University of Illinois where um, I found my voice and we started uh, the AAA Asian American Alliance. And uh, it was there that I met people who were like me that I could identify with. And I think that you, sitting here now, you are among people that you can identify with and that you can share your stories with. And uh, so it wasn't until I came out to, to California uh, and went to grad school that I found a whole state of people that were like us. And it, for someone who didn't have that, it was... It was so eye-awakening because I also found out that Asians aren't all wonderful people. Asians aren't all smart, educated. There are some bad apples out there, too. And my mother warned me about that. <laughs> she said, especially about dating, well, so-and-so, you know, maybe he's not so great, but he's Chinese. No. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, Mom. But um, so later on, after I got married, uh, I came back to to uh, Fremont, where I uh, was involved in the community, you know, raising my kids and getting involved in things because I was interested in them. And in that period of being a part of the community and contributing, um, you know, it just seemed like um, there was a lot that I was interested in. And being among other Asians and participating in activities and sharing the culture with my kids, I realized it was everything that I didn't have when I was growing up. And so um, later on, I uh, around 2006 or thereabouts, uh, I was involved in the uh, celebration of our city, Fremont. It had their 50th anniversary. 
and somehow or other, I got to be vice chair. And in that, I, le- I met a lot of people. And people were saying, well, you know what? You should run for office. And I said, what? I'd never thought about that before. But I kept hearing that over and over again. And so there was a point where I decided, well, I'll, I'll volunteer. So I became a planning commissioner, not realizing, because I was very naive, that that is usually a stepping stone to become to be uh, on city council. So sure enough, I get appointed to the uh, planning commission. I enjoy it. Uh, there's a lot of policy making. You hear from your constituents and residents, their concerns. And it was really very um, invigorating. And so someone said, well, why don't you run for city council? And I said, yes, I'm going to run as far away from that as possible because that is not my vision. That is not my dream. I've never thought about doing anything like that. But a vacancy became available. And um, every day, every single day for a solid year, I toiled. Should I do it? Should I not do it? I vacillated back and forth. I just didn't know, should I or shouldn't I? But this I did know. If I didn't run, there would be no Asian voice on that city council. And so I decided at the very last day that you can file, sitting on the corner of Fremont Boulevard and Paseo Padre, the light is uh, is red, and my husband says to me, if we go straight, we'll go back to the office. If we turn right, we'll go to City Hall. The light turns green, and I said, go turn, <laughs> and we went to City Hall. And, and so I, I was a nobody, at least I thought I was a nobody. And, and what happened is that there was a groundswell of people who really identified, well, we identified with each other. And my, my platform was, I w- I'm your voice. That mean, meant I want to hear your concerns. I want to know about what you care about. And let's see if we can make a difference in policy on the local uh, government. And so I became the first Chinese American female to uh, be on the city council and later was a base vice mayor. And I took that opportunity to connect with people. I am also not a victim or a, or a survivor, but I was able to hear stories that we've heard all through the day. And those are the people who I could then say, what can we do to help? because it wasn't on my radar. But when I heard that, I said, wait a minute. We need to do something. We have the power to to determine policy, to find help or funding for that particular program. And so that's what I tried to do. I I think I did. And uh, was uh, successful in building relationships. And I think that's one of the most important things is that we now, today, have created a lot of new relationships and also increased our network of people. So this is, this is something that I think we can take away from today is that we have a lot more that we need to learn. We have a lot more that we need to process, but we also need a lot more to do something, take words and put them into action. And so um, this year, 2018, is the year of the woman. There are, m- <laughs> yes. There are more women running for elected office than ever before. And this is something that I think that uh, if you have any inkling of doing something like that, um, you should really think about it and talk to people who are in elected office because we're here to mentor, we're here to hear, hear you and support you. So everyone up here, just, you guys are just rock stars. Like, this is, you are amazing, amazing uh, individuals. Um, so part of the I'm Ready movement is about building alliances with communities of color and marginalized groups. Um, and this is especially important in today's political climate when we are, um, are being pitted against one another. So what are some suggestions that you have for our attendees um, to take away from this conference, um, the AAPIs and our allies? to help build the solidarity and um, support our AAPI leadership stories. So I currently serve the students of New Haven Unified School District in Union City. And yeah, James Logan High School out there, I know. Um, And 
it's hard work, right? Because you're trying to change up a system that has that perpetuates these, you know, these ideals that aren't weren't necessarily made for us, right? Folks of color. Um, our students in New Haven Unified, 94% of them are students of color. If you juxtapose that with the, the demographics of our staff, our teachers, it's predominantly white, predominantly middle class. So the issues that our kids come to school with vastly differ. So one of the things we've been working on for a number of years, and I, and I know that New Haven Unified, we're, we're kind of ahead of the game. I've worked with folks from all over the country, and we talk about uh, the issues and the work that we've done in our districts, and I am really confident that, that we've come a long way, because we've done some explicit work on um, understanding equity, understanding implicit bias, uh, providing professional development for our teachers, our principals, but we still have a ways to go. But in terms of building solidarity, I am a believer that it has to happen um, in school, pre-K to 12th grade. And preschoolers and kindergartners, they are the first ones that come in with this idea of what fairness is. They are strong in their identity. And a lot of times by the time they leave fifth grade, we've wiped it out. We have erased their home culture. We've erased their languages that they come to school with. And we've made them these, you know, little children that can sit. And, uh, and now, you know, if you have kids or you have younger brothers or sisters, you hear about the Common Core standards and you hear parents say, I can't help them with this Common Core math. Let me kind of dispel the myth on that. It's basically what we're asking kids to do now is have a voice. We want our kids to be critical thinkers. We want them to have cultural competence. And what I mean by that is that we want kids to understand intersectionality from day one. What I need help with, what I need help with, and what I challenge everyone else in the audience and all of us to do is that you, you help with this work. You get kids' homeworks, whether it's your, your nieces or nephews or your own kids. You don't expect school to be the way it was when you were in school. You advocate for something different because it should be different. If those of us that maneuvered through school and were successful at it, we, we played it. We played the system. We knew how to do that. And for us, it worked. But now that we are in these positions of power, of privilege, where I get to sit and I get to help make policy for my district, where I get to be on a, a, a committee at the state level to look at adopted curriculum, what goes in textbooks, where I get to bring teachers together to write lesson plans and units that take into account multiple perspectives and the histories that you never learned about in your textbook, I need all of you to ask for that. Don't wait until you get to college. I would love for you know Dr. Rodriguez earlier this, this morning or Dr. Lee to get students at the university level and go, oh yeah, we learned about that in the eighth grade. Not to wait until college to get those stories and then get angry. We want kids to leave our system ready to turn stuff up and make change in the world. So that's what I challenge all of you to do, because I definitely need help with it. <clears throat> well, that's another question that has a lot <laughs> to unpack. All of these questions we can write a, a book. Um, intersectionality is really the key. You know, intersectionality is coined um, by an African-American woman who is a professor at UCLA Law School where I went to law school, go Bruin. Um, <laughs> her name is Kimberly Cranshaw. It's regarding a lawsuit, and the plaintiff was being pressured to answer the question of, well, it's either you were discriminated because you're a woman or because of your race. And Kimberly Cranshaw said, well, it could be both, right? It could be because of the intersection of her gender and her race which is, yes, it is, right? I mean, we can think about what is wrong with our society, who is the enemy or what is the enemy. It's those two things, right? It's white male supremacy. And all of us who doesn't fit there fall in one box. We are all lower, second class, and non-desirable. 
And one of the earliest and most effective way strategy of war is called divide and conquer. And the strategy that's been put to us is divide and conquer us to make us feel that some of us are better than others. And for us, Asian and Pacific Islander, you know, we know what that is. We have been made feel in this country to be the model minority. And it has given us some privilege. It has given us some great privilege in accessing universities and colleges in maybe being more desirable in hiring than um, African Americans, for example, or um, our counterparts from South and Central America or from the Middle East. Um, and a lot of us, we internalize that. And sometimes we think certain issues like Black Lives Matter don't affect us because we are not like that. We are educated. We're, we're, I think the last statistic was, you know, we are one of the, on the top of like per household income, right? But it's not true. Well, that one wasn't disaggregated, which right. is what we've been talking yeah. about, like <laughs> this uh, conference, yeah. Yeah, it affects us too. Um, and that's part of the strategy, is to divide and conquer. And we need to, to address that to recognize that we, we are all in the same box. And the only way to defeat the enemy is for us to be together and to show up for each other. So what, what, am I, what are my suggestions on how to build solidarity and intersectionality? We really have to show up. A lot of us are engaged in social media. A lot of us are very um, eloquent in speaking. But if you're not showing up in a Black Lives Matter rally, or you're not speaking in a city council meeting about the violence that uh, African American people in this country are experiencing, you're not showing up. Um, because if we don't help them, we all fall into that same, you know, the same cycle of violence and inequality. And everything is perpetrated against all of us. So, I mean, I, I, I have a lot of ideas, but it all boils down to that. And, you know, in terms of cisgender and transgender women, transgender women are a very small minority in this country, but with a very high rate of murder and suicide. And the murders are not just simple murders, they're horrendous murders, like being burned alive or, or being chopped into pieces. And sometimes I hear some, you know, women say, well, you know, it doesn't affect me. But we are all women. The violence that is being perpetrated against a transgender woman is also rooted in the violence, the source of violence that is gender motivated, right? Um, by this toxic patriarchal system. Um, so if you're not showing up, if you're a cisgender woman and you're not showing up for transgender women, just as if you're an Asian person and you're not showing up for the African American community, then you know we can talk to social media, we can write a bunch of blogs, but it's not helping out. We really have to show up. Thank you. Show up for others like you guys showed up for us. And hire transgender women. Um, again, I, I want to be a listener today. So I, I want to go back actually to what she referenced to, which is our consumption of social media, right? It's really easy to be a social media activist. And I think it's important. All mediums are important. But I also find that social media makes us very easy to complacency. Uh, complicitness as well as narcissism. We spend a lot of time, you know, stressing about what hashtags we use, what angles we have, how airbrushed this looks, whatever, right? How many, how many likes we get as forms of personal affirmation. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you took away even just a small percentage of your time that you spent caring about that and infused a little bit of that into actually hearing from your transgender sister about what she's freaking out about because her existence might get wiped out by the current administration. 
and just listening. I mean, that you you have no clue how much power that will give that individual just on the sheer fact that you made time to make sure that their existence was felt and their pain was felt. Um, and I think, again, being in the position where I've I've been the receiver, my company has been the receiver of a lot of these personal tragedies, but also stories of, tri excuse me, triumph, um, stories of pain. Uh, I have learned that there is something to be said about so let me let me give you an example. I personally am not the type of person to show up at the Women's March. Not because I'm not an ally, not because I don't believe, but because it literally gives me physical anxiety. <laughs> like I shut down, my chest starts hurting. It's just, you know, that's my own thing. However, that doesn't negate the fact that I really care. But then I've had to find my own ways and my own definition of what it means to be an ally then. And there's no right or wrong. What is wrong though is if you don't act. And act does not mean necessarily a half million person protest. It can mean listening to your transgender sister. It could mean listening to your African American friend who is dealing with something really painful and personal in their existence. Um, so going back to what I was saying earlier about if even if you personally have not experienced assault or are not do not identify as a survivor, victim, et cetera, if these uh, current issues don't necessarily resonate with you directly, um, open your eyes a little bit more and reduce that time that you spend on you know, areas of self-absorption, as I call it, and spend that time you know, really actually listening to the people around you. I actually stopped using my Facebook after the Forbes protest because I realized how much time I was wasting, just even the passive flicking on the phone. And in organizing that protest, you know, there were definitely individuals under 30 who leaned towards the administration that was there. And even just broke, breaking bread and having conversations with them to understand why, especially being a millennial, especially having an opportunity to create change, asking them why would you want to revert back the rights that have started to be given to so many Americans, which is ultimately the most patriotic thing that, that we can do for each other. Um, it was a really powerful and transformative experience for me, and it made me realize how, how toxic technology has become. So, you know, I encourage everyone here to reflect on that and to realize that, you know, as intimidating as a protest may be, it's okay to say that's not for you, but then ask yourselves, how can you create the time, the space, uh, the heart space and the mind space to actually be an ally um, that means something for you and ultimately uh, to the people in your community. So um, I spoke briefly about uh, building networks of uh, like-minded people and also opening our, yourself to hearing about areas that you may not have known about and uh, to be receptive, to hear, to be, have that sensitivity that there are other issues that you need to educate yourself on to become just a better human being. And um, one of the things that after I left public office uh, the last couple of years, uh, I helped co-found a, uh, a class at uh, Cal State East Bay, uh, which, is, uh, it's, which we <laughs> is an API leadership class. And uh, to the left of me is Danby, and then we have Annie over there, and, and Sani, and uh, Nancy, uh, who are a part of the staff, and we had a couple of students as well. And I have to tell you, that has been such a, I return back to education. Uh, I've taught before um, at a variety of uh, community colleges and over at San Jose State. That was where I did my, um, I was a scientist, and so I taught microbiology and immunology and biology, and now I'm into the poli-sci. And uh, what, <laughs> what I found is that we were identifying young students who were, uh, well, first of all, uh, primarily they're Asian uh, American, but again, Asian Americans are very broad umbrella. We have all different types, and especially our Pacific Islander students who have not, don't have a lot of the privileges that we've talked about 
Uh, they don't have the financial wherewithal. A lot of them are working uh, to put themselves through the school. They're first immigrants. Uh, they're first to go to college. And so for them, it's, it's a different challenge than someone who has the wherewithal and parents that are supporting them to go to college and, you know, and become successful. Because success is defined by an individual. But society oftentimes puts that on as a label. You must be this, this, and this in order to be successful. Well, successful for a, a student who is struggling is to make uh, payments on their car or their rent or to pay for groceries and yet still find time to go to school and study and, and be successful. So in our leadership class, what we did is we brought leaders from every possible uh, career and profession, healthcare, the legal profession, uh, social activists, attorneys, judges, and we, what we did is we had them, I keep doing that, we had them talk about, we talked today about stories. They shared their stories. They shared their journey, the path to get to where they were. And it, what it did is it put, a, it humanized them. They weren't just this judge on the Superior Court judge uh, or bench. This was a young person who was the first to go to law school and what they had to do in order to pass the, the law exam or, you know, to get the door shut on their face, as, you know, in applying for something. So it was these stories that people could identify with. And, and this, this gives our students hope and realization that, you know what, it's not going to be a, a golden ticket. You have to work. And how, what was it, your failures, the successes, this is what they learned so that they can see that, you know, it's okay, it's okay if it's rough, but just hang in there. You know, you can do it because you have people behind you that believe in you. And so I think at this point in time, certainly in my life, this is the time of mentorship. This is the time where, you know, I look at people and I say, you know what, why not do what you want to do? Believe in yourself. You can do it. You know, we see up here on this panel and throughout the day, you know, there are people that, you know, it wasn't easy but they've made it. And so it is now our turn to help you, the younger people in the audience, to, to realize your dreams. And, and so that, I think, is something that's very important, mentorship. You know, uh, our speakers would say over and over again, oh, if only I had a program like this. Imagine what they could have done. Well, what they can do now is to help um, the next generation. So. So one of the things that everyone's talked about that I really liked is this um, idea of that you had someone help you and that you, you talked about survival, Maria, and now recognizing the position of privilege that we're all in and then paying it forward. Um, we've honored the legacies and now us leaders up here and in the audience, like we are going to become the legacy for the next generation. So pay it forward, um, and I want to thank the panelists again, and Dr. One is coming back up, I believe, yes? So r another round of applause for our wonderful panelists. Thank you guys so much. Make sure you stand up and clap and thank these folks for all the work that they do. Education leaders, lawyers, business owners, government officials, professors, we are doing everything, folks of us who aren't even doing you know, who are doing community work all in these streets, we are what everyone here is calling a leader.